Hey, morning grade sevens. Today we're going to be marking apostrophes. Please compare my answers to that of yours and if you got something incorrect then please correct it. Okay, the first uh, number two says the pencil is ours. Um, okay, so because ours is a possessive pronoun, it won't receive any apostrophe because it already shows us um, who's the owner and who's in possession. Okay, so number four. This is the school of the boys. Because there are many boys that own the school, the apostrophe comes after the S, all right, to show that many boys own the school. Um, he is the son of Marcus. Marcus is one person, so the apostrophe comes after the S, and then you have another S. So he is Marcus's son. The flowers of the plants. The plants, flowers. Because there's only one plant, um, that therefore there'll only be an apostrophe after the S. Um, sorry, guys, for this one, I think we already marked it. Okay, so in this case here, there are many plants, so the apostrophe goes after the word plants, right? Because it's a plural, so in plurals, the apostrophe always goes after the S if that plural ends with the S, right? Number nine, please close the car, the door of the car. Because it's an inanimate object, you say, please close the car door. All right. Um, I don't think it will necessarily be wrong if you say, please close the car's door. You know that therefore you're being very specific about perhaps which car you want closed, or which car door you want closed. But yeah, the, you know, just the basic rule is for inanimate or non-living objects, they do not receive an apostrophe. The flowers of the plant are red. So um, in this case here, there's only one plant. So the apostrophe goes after the end of the word and you add an S. The plants, flowers are red. Okay, the house is hers. So because hers is a possessive pronoun, it stays the same, all right? The sentence stays the same. It does not get an apostrophe. All right, the light of the sun. Now, as you've noticed, I've added an apostrophe S here. Um, I wasn't originally meant to give you guys this example, but I just want to add one more rule here. So this is an, basically an exception to the rule because I did tell you guys that when it comes to inanimate objects, um, you know, you, you don't have an apostrophe, right? But as soon as we talk about any celestial body, celestial bodies are uh, any objects in the solar system. So the sun, the moon, the stars, asteroids, orbits, etc. All of those will receive apostrophes, including the sun. So therefore the sun's light, um, you know, with an apostrophe there, okay? All right. Number 15, the seat belongs to the gentleman, the gentleman's seat. Because gentleman is plural, right, therefore it will have an apostrophe S, and yeah, that's how we'll have it. Next one, the, the website of the college is confusing. So, in this case, there is an inanimate uh, owner, right, the inanimate owner is the college, the college owns the website. So it will not receive an apostrophe. It will become the college website is confusing. Do you want to walk to the side of the river? In this case, we also have another inanimate object that's the owner, right? So it will become, do you want to walk to the river side? Instead of saying, do you want to walk to the river's side? You don't need to put an apostrophe S for that. Number 19, I want to ride in the car body. I want to ride in Bobby's car because Bobby is a one person and he receives a, an apostrophe S. Yes. I want to pet the head of the dog. I want to pet the dog's head. The dog is the owner of his head. We should not take the car from uh, of my father to the beach. Becomes, we should not take my father's car to the beach. This wallet belongs to Tito. 
this is Tito's wallet. All right, and I remember that I put, oops. Okay, so there were two more questions here. I have no idea why it's erased. Just give me a second. Okay, so for number 23, the hand of the watch, here are the same rules, rule applies because uh, word watch is an inanimate object. It doesn't necessarily receive a apostrophe, right? So the watch hand. Right. It does sound a bit weird to say it like that, but um, I'm sure if you do say it as the watch's hand, it will, it will still be fine, right? Because it sounds correct. Okay, the ticking of the clocks, because there are many clocks in this regard, and you know, uh, we want to know we want to know if, it's, if something is plural or something is singular. So we'll say the clocks ticking. All right. If you've written that, then that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah. Okay, hey guys, I'm sure if you say the clock's ticking without an apostrophe, that will be fine as well because it is a it is an inanimate object. All right, so we're moving on to our literature for chapter nine. We're gonna mark those questions there, right? So do the same thing. Um, judge your own work, compete with my answers and correct it. Okay, chapter nine, number one. How is the weather like at this time of the year? Well, it's raining heavily, right? The weather's not so good. What is Jess afraid of? Jess is afraid of drowning in the water as they cross the creek and each day gets harder for him to cross the creek. Can you see how I am answering in four sentences? If you just tell me drowning, or water, I'm not going to give you the mark because you need to put it for me in a complete sentence. All right. Okay. So number three, how does the author create a foreboding mode mood in this chapter? Give evidence for your answer using the PE principle. Okay. So foreboding means you know a sense that something bad or evil or you know not nice is going to happen in the future. Right, so what, how does the author hint to us that something bad is going to be unfolding? So you need to give it to me as point evidence evaluation. So your point is the author sets a foreboding scene that tells us something terrible is to come. Can you see that I've uh, that I've added the word foreboding scene? All right. Um, so so this tells me this begs the question. Well, what scene is the author? was the author talking about then you give your evidence to back up your point well the scene is the heavy rain is a sign of misfortune misfortune is you know good things are not about to happen jess does not speak to his speak his fear of crossing the creek as he feels that his fear is a weakness which he perceives leslie to have none of right so jess is very afraid of crossing the creek the creek is like a um it's like a valley right uh like a deep trench where water can collect right and it can create like a stream and jess is very very afraid but he doesn't tell leslie he doesn't communicate his fears to leslie right because he thinks that leslie doesn't have any fears then lastly evaluation so evaluation is where you judge the you judge the situation, right? You you come to a final decision or opinion about this, you know how the why the author and how the author is creating a, a foreboding scene. He cannot immerse him, himself in the fantasy of Terabithia because his intuition is telling him that this is not a good idea. So guys, intuition is what we call like your sixth sense. That inner voice, you know, your conscience telling you that something, you know, is wrong, something's funny or shady about a situation, right? And if you listen to it, you, you know, most of the time you're right. But if you ignore that voice, then it gets you into trouble. 
So he does not want to feel inferior to Leslie. Inferior means feeling less than, not feeling as awesome as somebody else, right? So he does not voice his fears, which in turn causes her to become oblivious to the danger exposed to crossing the creek. Oblivious means when you don't care about when you um, when you're doing something, but you don't know of the harms it can cause. Right. So in a nutshell, guys, the evaluation should tell me that, you know, Jess feels a fear and, he, you know, the heavy rains is a huge sign to him that something bad is going to happen. But the author also creates a foreboding scene because Jess is too afraid to, to voice his fears to Leslie because he thinks that Leslie is going to see that as a weakness and she's she knows she's not going to value his friendship anymore and um so you know and this in in turn this actually scars and destroys their friendship or you know causes there to be danger for leslie right because he doesn't explain to her how he feels about the creek and you guys will see that a horrible horrible thing happens um because jess does not want his fears to get in the way of their friendship and sometimes fear is good i mean fear is there to protect us as well right okay and lastly i want to read this little excerpt um it's just a little explanation about chapter nine right just as self self-hatred because of his fears is clearly evident in the chapter so just really hates himself for being scared he detests himself, detests his hate, for his fear of the creek, feeling it makes him feel, makes him inferior to Leslie. But because he's afraid of the creek, we kind of get a sense that, ooh, okay, so something bad is going to happen with this creek. As mentioned before, Chess has a horror of being afraid of anything, probably stemming from his father's well-known expectations that he will be a true man, right? So a true man doesn't feel scared, doesn't um, you know, voice his fears, just keep silent. As a result, he's unable to speak to Leslie about his fears, even though she could probably have found a way of comforting him or alleviating his fears. Alleviate means to make something less or to, to better something, right? So, you know, Leslie is, is very understanding and she's very respectful of all emotions. She's that kind of person, right? And, you know, what Jess hasn't realized is that Leslie will, she's not going to deny him or, you know, think of him as inferior if he voices his fears to her. He is paralyzed by his own sense of shame and he seems to feel that if Leslie ever knew he was afraid, she would have less respect for him. In reality, this is almost certainly not so. In just the last chapter, Leslie was shown to be afraid of Janice Avery. Right. Yeah. So, you know, he feels that Leslie is going to be going to lose respect for him if he if he shows her how, his vulnerability. Right. But true friendship is you can sh when you show someone your vulnerability, they will respect you. Right. If someone doesn't respect you when you're vulnerable, then that's not really your friend. And le it doesn't mean that Leslie is perfect. Leslie also felt fear, you know, when that whole Janice Avery episode happened. Jess, however, does not seem able to remember this, or in remembering, does not grasp its true significance. Fear is a natural thing, and Jess's expectation of fearlessness from himself is unrealistic and probably harmful psychologically. But he has no one to tell him that. His family certainly will not be able to tell him that, not believing it themselves. Leslie does not know how he feels, she can't do anything for him all right and this is why a really horrible thing happens because jess is too afraid of ruining their friendship by you know expressing his fear to leslie but he doesn't realize that by not expressing his fear he is putting leslie in danger okay uh, so guys, that's just a little overview of what we discussed and what was in the chapter. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson and um, yeah, have an awesome day ahead.